It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 52, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today is Mark Bowen from Bluebird Gardens in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. Mark farms 320 acres with his wife, Diane, and a crew of 10 employees. Starting with six acres in 1978, selling produce at a farm stand, they grew Bluebird Gardens to over 2,000 CSA members and 80 drop sites in far northwestern Minnesota and the Fargo-Moorhead metro area. Mark is an enthusiastic farmer and his zeal for the craft shows when he shares how he has transitioned the farm to include a year on year off rotation of cover crops and vegetables. We get into the nuts and bolts of Bluebird Gardens cover crop system, including the challenges, the planting techniques and the tools he's using to establish and manage the cover crops. Bluebird Gardens is also in the midst of a marketing transition, and we delve into the changes Mark is making to make his food accessible to a wider swath of the population than just the customers who are able to make a CSA work for their lifestyle. Plans include marketing Bluebird Gardens produce in local grocery stores and increasing agritourism opportunities on the farm. We also get into some of the harvest mechanization Mark has used to manage so many vegetables with a small staff, as well as irrigation and crop planting. When I first met Mark at the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Conference a number of years ago, I recognized him as a kindred spirit with a passion for produce and making his farm work better. I'm sure you'll like him just as much as I do. Enjoy the show. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality composts and compost based living soils for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Mark Bowen, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Wow, thank you. It's awesome to be here. I'm I'm really pleased to have you on, Mark. We we were actually just talking about this in the pre-show chat about how we met at the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Growers Conference a couple of years back, and I I remember hearing you talk and just being instantly attracted to what you were doing because you're doing it on such a you're doing vegetables on such a scale. I mean, it's like you're you're not a small thinker, and and I really and I appreciate that. And I mean, I like small scale farmers too, and and I think, but I I like that you're thinking big. And that makes me really excited. The other thing that I think is really interesting is where you're doing this. So if you could kind of set the stage for us for, you know, tell us a little bit about your farm, how you got where you are. And well, and first of all, let's just start. Where in the world is Fergus Falls, Minnesota for, <laughs> for our listeners who, yeah. who don't even really know where Minnesota is? And where am I? That's a good question. Um, Fergus Falls is a city of about 14,000 people in West Central Minnesota. So we're halfway on the interstate between Alexandria, Minnesota, and Fargo-Moorhead. And Alexandria is like halfway between Minneapolis and Fargo-Moorhead, right? Pretty, pretty much a third of the way, maybe. But yeah, that's on the track to Minneapolis, you bet. You're then marketing into Fargo, North Dakota is where most of your product's going. Is that right? You no, know, they have turned out to be 70% of our CSA members. And and, you know, for any farmer, whatever size they are, your farming career, however you do it, is an evolution, you know, and whatever whatever size you are is, is perfect for that moment. We we started out in 1978. I was a teacher in Fergus Falls, which I continued to do for 34 years. And we um, were just married. We had a 10-acre farm. Um, four of those acres were yard. Um, six was sealed. Half the field was underwater. And we had a Troy built pillar a garden weight cards and a Ford Pinto. I mean, that is how we started. Horrible time to start with vegetables because everyone had their own garden. I mean, talk about being ill-timed, you know, but we, Scandinavian, you know, we continued on despite <laughs> the fact that it started out slow. Uh, and the stands, which we did for 30 some years, grew and grew and grew. Um, and then and then we evolved out of the stands because it was like, oh my gosh, we're, we could just sell what we raise. And even though we have a terrific, amazing day, you know, with the stands, um, if you're not selling at all, you know, your farm, you know, is lacking. And so that it was kind of out of that despair. We started the CSA, which um, tripled our, you know, tripled what we were able to bring out to people. So our CSA grew to about 2000 members and 70 percent of them were in Fargo Moorhead, you know, but we served a wide area. We had 80 drop-off locations, um, but we're evolving again because, because you know, as you know, Chris, the CSA is a tough monkey. Um, it's um, 
if, if it appeals to such a narrow band of people, disciplined eaters who really want to be connected to the farm. And, and the problem is 85% of um, produce uh, or food is consumed two hours after purchasing it, which means people fly by the seat of their pants. They're so busy, it's not their fault, and they just run and grab something and eat. And so our our agony of evolution right now is just realizing that and what should we grow to it. So that's the exciting plans we're in the middle of. Okay. I You know, that's something I'd never heard before that, did you say 80% of food is consumed within two hours of yeah, being purchased? Yeah, 85% is. 85%, food, wow. Which means that organized, planned out, you know, meal does not happen. And so, so we're evolving um, big time into wholesale. You know, like in Fergus Falls, we've done stands here forever. And then we did the CSA and and we serve with our CSA a mere six percent of the Fergus Falls, you know, and the and most people think, oh no, I couldn't do the whole box of a CSA, or what if I got what I didn't want, or what if I got too much, or um, so last year we evolved into build your own box at the truck. It's by gosh, we are gonna make you happy, you know. So we took away all the obstacles of a CSA, and I'm not bashing CSA, I love CSA. Yeah. So we did build your own box to the truck. Our trucks went out to the people in bulk and they came with their punch cards that reflected their order and put what they wanted in their box. They built their own box right at the truck. It was just a beautiful reunion of farm with members every week. And you're managing that. Is that still over 80 drop sites when you were no, doing that? No, and see, see people, that's a really good question. People want three things. You know, they want choice. And they want convenience and they want a connection to the farm. And and so the years of our 80 truck look, drop off locations, um, we had convenience, but of course we fell short on choice because um, some people want to kill every week and some didn't want to see it at all. Um, both are unforgivable sins, you know, whichever side you go on. Right. <laughs> and so, like in Fargo Morehead, we went from 50 drop off locations to just like five truck locations where they come to the truck. So then we lost a little bit of convenience, you know. So then those those people who love getting their box at work um, didn't want to drive the box it took to. But if we had. About as many members, I mean, and, and, and people loved it. Um, the problem there is we spent an awful lot of time trucking out to be the store, you know, and you also have to run the farm. So everything is just such a low balance. I remember a contractor friend of mine, um, we were talking about about our businesses and he he made this, he drew a triangle and he said, you know, he, and the, he labeled the sides of the triangle. He said, you know, this side's right. You can have it done right. You can have it done cheap or you can have it yeah. done fast. Wow. And he said, you can pick any two. Yeah. You don't get all three. I imagine it's somewhat the same with this choice, convenience and connection idea that, yeah. you know, for CSA members. And of course, I think what's hard sometimes about the CSA, and especially when you're when you're doing two thousand CSA shares, is that you know you almost have to try to make everybody happy you know, at that scale. You do. I mean, you do not want to lose members, otherwise you're gathering a lot, and then you spend a lot on ads. And um, you know, the average, according to Small Farm Central, anyway, the average um, retention of a CSA farm is is forty percent. That means every year they're beating the bushes finding new people. Uh, now, some CSAs retain 90%, some lose 90%, so there's that whole gamut in between. And, you know, we usually kept about 50 to 60%, but that means we were trying to find a lot of new people every year, you know, and, and we egg and ice over, well, I, I, thought, I thought I could make everybody happy all the time. And, um, and, and it was really just, um, it was too much for them, or they moved away, or um, they wasted some because they didn't like, you know, a certain thing in the box. So it's funny because they can um, they can go to Walmart and fill their fridge with produce, and if that gets wasted, they don't blame Walmart. But um, if if they don't use all the CSA produce, they 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 do blame me. So <laughs> at least that's what I kind of <laughs> heard. Uh, but I do love the CSA, so I'm not bashing it. It's just I think. CSA farms across America have to really 
be proactive and find out how we need to tweak it to to make it happen. And uh, the build your own box of the truck was certainly an evolution toward that. Um, it could blossom to become very, very cool. But we're um, right now just thinking, you know what? What if we brought the story of the farm <clears throat> right into the store where people shop? Like, like, like not just drop the produce off, but the story, um, the videos, the pictures, <clears throat> the, the signage, um, tons and tons of social media, you know, where where they really feel connected to the farm. And then if that store, too, were the place where people do connect with their farm, like that's where they buy the tickets to the corn maze and the, the farm to table meals in our magic woods, you know. And so, so I mean, we're wanting this to be so win for those stores where they become the local produce store and are the only source locally of our produce. So it's, it's um, boy, we're just feeling tremendous groundswell um, excitement over that or oh you mean your stuff will be in service food and and um <clears throat> yeah well i mean and so so we're um kind of getting out from under being the store my my wife and i in the truck routes we left three afternoons a week we leave the farm at two and come back at ten you know and then then i'm not at home running the farm either am i so that was what we yeah. kind of struggled with um uh, because everything is like that three triangle thing. I mean, it's like you can almost put anything in life on that. And the pros and the cons and the effects of it all um, makes makes us all become problem solvers. Um, well, and I think and I think constantly keeping up with the evolving circumstances that you find yourself in. Yeah, well, you know, well, I true? mean, CSA 10 years ago was was pretty cool and and it was kind of new and there were a lot of people that were sort of from from a customer standpoint who were jumping into it, were excited about it. And and I think we've as a as a movement in a lot of places we kind of burned through those people that wanted to that wanted to sample it. That you know, hanging fruit has already been picked. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Although, you know, and I, and I, and I just did an, I just wrote a newsletter about this. So, so I, if anybody who read that, I'm sorry, it sounds like I'm beating you over the head with it, but I think the interesting thing about that low hanging fruit idea is that it's one of those metaphors that's lost meaning with time that, that actually the, the low hanging fruits easy to get at, but it's also the stuff that's, that doesn't get as much sunshine and it yeah. doesn't get as much nutrients yeah. from the tree. And if you get up onto those up in those higher branches, you actually get bigger, sweeter, more flavorful fruit up there. It's actually the stuff that's up in the up in the top of the tree that's actually the best fruit. That's a beautiful analogy. Yeah, that's cool. And I just I love that idea because I think it really points to I mean, and and yes, there's you know, you want to grab the low hanging fruit and it's a great place to start, but it's not necessarily what's gonna what's gonna be the best thing over the long run. Yeah. You're you're very right. So 2,000 CSA members, and, and you're transitioning to, to some wholesale right now this this winter. Yeah. And and I and I want to and I want to make sure that we circle back and talk about how you're working on making those connections with the grocery stores. Yeah. But but I I'd like you to kind of tell us about Bluebird Gardens. You know, you said you guys started with with six acres of vegetables sure. in in 1978, but you've got a lot more than six acres now. We we do. Um... <laughs> the funny thing about farming is a lot of bad happens. I mean, has any bad happened to you, Chris, in your farming? Oh, no, no. My my farm was perfect. <laughs> that's, oh, that's awesome. Well, I'm patting you on the back right now. <laughs> no, no, no. And, and yeah, my farm was perfect. I've also got a bridge in Brooklyn that I would like to sell you. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's so cool. That's funny. And, and the thing for us all to remember, I think, is that the good does come out of bad. I mean, when you're soul searching and finding a better way, it's kind of like a new door, you know, that's opening for you. And the thing we've always done in our farm is um, each year look at what's backwards. I mean, it sounds like a negative thing, but if you look at what's backwards, you can kind of problem solve and and find a better way, you know, for it. And sometimes it's easy to bump along and deal with those backwards things year after year after year. And it's like, no, take a look at them and see what's making you backwards. Um, 
for 30 years, you know, we pulled our little corn carts through the corn and harvested corn that way. It wasn't backwards then. Um, it wasn't until we started the CSA and really started needing volume of corn. It's like, wow, we need a better way to harvest that corn. And so we used a veg veyer, which was one of the best things we ever bought. The veg veyer came to the farm, um, made in Michigan, um, because we were kind of getting back aches from hauling bins and melons out of the field. And, um, and so here, this 30 foot conveyor, which leads to a trailer behind, you know, is, it was a magic tool for us. But for sweet corn, it still took the whole sap all morning, you know, to pick that corn. So then we got the Oxbow um, CP100 corn puller. And, um, so we, we sort of bumped along in, in equipment and the CSA allowed us the money to actually just buy that equipment. Um, to make the farm not back backwards, so we would we would the whole staff for a whole afternoon, you know, would be on our hands and knees picking eighty three five gallon fields of beans, you know, for one CSA truck route. And so getting the BH one hundred bean harvester from Oxbow was probably the best thing we ever did, you know. And getting the packing shed was the best thing we ever did. And and so we each sort of bump along to slowly acquire over time, acquire over time the things that make our farm not backwards. So I mean we're up to 404 acres, but they're not all tillable, but 320 are. And and the reason for the our beginning to buy land was realizing that the weather has gone crazy, you know, and a five inch rain is now the new norm. And it's like we were farming all our land, trying to cover crop, but we were getting it compacted and weeds. And, and it's like, how do we turn that around? Well, we, we buy enough land so we can now have alternating strips of crop and cover crop over the whole farm. And, you know, the secret to farming is cover crops and it is organic matter in the soil and it's allowing the biology to flourish. And for years, I listened to this guy who, you know, um, and, uh, you know, said, oh, we're building the house with the biology. And it was just through the powders that you'd spread on your farm. And this bologna, you know, it's, it's organic matter, you know, that builds the house for the biology. And you want to add those powders because they do get mined and taken out of the land. But biology makes um, makes it all happen. And that's, that's through organic, organic matter. <clears throat> And so, so you've got these alternating strips. How how wide are those? They're, um, you know, we decided to make them eighty feet, um, mostly because that's what that's what we needed to do one week of CSA corn or beans or whatever. Um, but it's also a short enough strip, so if you get a really big rain, those cover crop strips are close enough together so that they can stop, you know, movement of land. Um, but we also do cover crops. Um, on the vegetable strips, you know, most most strips have cover crops before, during, and after the vegetables. Um, and so we just want to mimic nature, you know, and and keep that soil covered. And it's just it's just been exciting, you know, to see the land beneath our feet become alive, you know, and, and just breathing. Um, we had a an intern who was here. This spring, we bought this land across the highway. And in our area, we're high in magnesium and low in calcium, which makes really hard, tight, cranky soil. And so it was no fault to the farmer. That's just the way it was. But but he watched us that first spring and took part in trying to plant in that hard soil. And then he came back um, later fall the next year and said, wow, the soil's alive, you know. And it's kind of exciting, you know, to see that change. So we're in a real rapid stage of learning cover crops. You know, we love Sudan grass, but why just plant Sudan grass? Why not mix it with sun hemp, which is a legume, and clover, which will come back the next year? So beyond the Sudan grass, you're not trying to plant vetch and rye, which can't grow because all the nitrogen is tied up. I mean, and so one becomes smarter. So this year at Moses, I'm speaking about cover crops, which is my new passion. Well, and and I think it was a passion that when you were at the Minnesota Fruit and Vegetable Growers, you were you. I think you you just started doing this. I mean, that was yeah. maybe three or four years ago. Exactly. Uh, yep, you're right. 
Yeah. So, so, um, and, and just to be clear, when you say you're talking to Moses about it, that's at the Moses organic farming conference, which is coming up here at the end of February, just as a, as a footnote there. Um, so the, so when, when you're doing a cover crop rotation, you know, so you've got a year of, of, of cover crop and a year of vegetables and you've got some cover crop mixed in with those vegetables. Can you, do you have a typical rotation that you're following with that? Um, I mean, are yeah. you doing something? I mean, I always think of like the, what Ann and Eric Nordell are doing where they've got kind of this, this very strict, you know, we do an early crop followed by Ryan Vetch, you know, followed by cover crop the next year, followed by a late crop that goes back to, you know, just rye and then back into the cover crops. Right. Are you doing something as strict as that or is, is um, it a little bit more catch as catch can? It's, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, I mean, it, as vegetable farmers, we're, we're taxed for time and all those kinds of things. And so you partly do what fits, but I, I'm learning that the more I mix the crops, the more I'm mimicking nature, but then also the more I'm not needing to be replanting. And so one of our best termination tools, believe it or not, is the stock chopper where, you know, you just um, break that cover crop into bits that the biology can, can, you know, chew up and not kill at all. And so like, like our main summer one, you know, will be Sudan grass, but also mixed in with sun hemp, also mixed in with clovers and the, the sun hemp and the Sudan grass will keep stock chopping um, and then Sudan grass grows a whole new set of roots and a whole new plant and keeps making like up to 18,000 pounds of organic matter per acre. But then those little clovers, you know, are the ones that are going to make it through the winter and come back and um, become the natural nitrogen for the vegetable crop that follows that. And, and so we're, um, you know, sweet clover will have roots five feet deep, you know, and not only reduce compaction, but bring all this nitrogen to the soil um and then and then one that's often with our vegetable crops like with tomatoes or melons or the broccoli or cauliflower are also clovers just because they uh, make this nice little tiny short bed during the vegetable season but then when you mow the the vegetables down then they too come back um I, and I, I still love vetch and rye i mean we do those where they fit in nice beautiful fall um cover crop that comes back the next spring uh um oh field peas and oats in the spring if we're going to for example plant um uh oh sweet corn or anything later in the season i mean there's nothing better than field peas and oats in the spring um so if we have land that for some reason was didn't get planted the fall before it's instantly field peas and oats the next spring and you know just makes just beautiful soil you know from that and you can't beat field radish and turnips either for scavenging nitrogen it's like it's like all the problems that are in agriculture the hypoxia zone the size of the state of massachusetts in the gulf of mexico that it's gotten so much nutrients that the algae have used up all the oxygen so it's like a dead zone um happened because yeah. we haven't covered our soils with cover crops that scavenge the nutrients um and hang on to them there and so it's fun to see youtubes of big giant farmers conventional farmers who are now flying cover crop seed into their soybeans and their corn and seeing just major changes happen so i think i think um we're just on the edge of, of turning farming in the whole country around you know through the use of cover crops you know, you you mentioned that the the farmers flying on the cover crops, and and I follow a lot of news out of Practical Farmers of Iowa, and and they they've been there's been a lot of experimentation and discussion with that over the last couple of years. But how how are you doing it on on your 320 acres of vegetables? Can you tell us a little bit more about the the tools and the t that you're using to to actually manage that cover crop from seed? through getting ready for the vegetables the, the following year. Right. Very, very good point. Um, in fact, at the Moses conference, I'm showing a, a video of earthworms coming up at night to snatch the little bits the stock chopper um, chopped up. Um, changing the soil. I mean, they are the killer. So, I mean, we love the stock chopper as the foremost one. Um, this would be our next favorite tool. Um, it, it, it will kind of get it into the top part of the soil without destroying all the goodness that 
you know, every time the cover crop sends a root down, that becomes a channel. Well, why would we want to till that up? Every time an earthworm burrows down, that becomes a channel that roots can follow, but also that can absorb um, rain. We we kind of were planning to order a big disc chisel, you know, with teeth that go almost to China. And then after going to the Minnesota Organic and hearing this amazing lady speak, thought, well, why would we want to do that? So luckily it never came to the farm. Uh, we have two grain rows. One is a hay buster no-till. You know, whenever we can put a cover crop in no-till, we'll do that. Um, uh, we're, we're heading a lot, you know, as fast as we dare. We're going to do it guardedly into no-till just because uh, that's what nature does. But we have a, an old grain row my dad had, an old John Deere one, and that works great too. You can use a cyclone seed or two, um, like in the last cultivation of tomatoes or corn or beans, you can go broadcasting with a three-point hitch cyclone seeder, the, the clovers or whatever you want to, you know, get in there. Just in, and basically leave them laying on top of the soil. Yeah, and, and then and you then... want to irrigate it, you know, because then, then they're set. I mean, they're set to go. And, and if you don't have irrigation, that's the challenge. We've had a lot of dry falls lately where you cannot get a cover crop growing very well. Accidental surprise this year, though, was um, Matt had left um, uh, clovers in the uh, rain drill by accident when he did the sedan grass. And it's like, oh, my gosh, this is brilliant. Look how that clover crop survived the thick sedan grass. And now it's all set and we're not needing to plant it again in the fall, just um, stock chop the sedan grass. And we're all set for a cover crop being over winter and growing the next spring. So many good things come out of accident. It's kind of funny. You know, we just did an interview recently with uh, with Mark Shepard, the, oh, the, yeah, he's the amazing. permaculture guy, right? Yeah. And and you know, part of what he talks about in his in his perennial systems is this idea of of stacking crops. And I think it's interesting that that's that's essentially what you're doing with your cover crops, right? You're stacking the Sudan grass yeah. on top of the clover. Yeah, and you know, kind of naturally arranging for some succession exactly. to happen, you know, with the, the, the annual Sudan grass and, and the, the perennial clover, or at least the biennial clover, right. you know, to kind of, you're sort of setting up some of that, those ecosystem processes. Cause of course you're working in a much more disturbed environment. So you right. have to manage it from year to year, but it's interesting that some of those same principles apply. It, it is so true, you know, and it's kind of about really thinking ahead and trying to work smarter instead of harder. So Mark, you, you mentioned the, the importance of having irrigation. Are you irrigating all 320 of those acres that you've got in vegetables? Well, yeah, we have, we have five wells, we have three traveling guns. Um, the exciting thing we're learning though, is that when you have organic matter in the soil through cover crops, then they will hold that two and a half inch rain, which is almost always immediately followed by a two month drought, you know, and so it's kind of buffering out those extremes. So like last summer, we found ourselves irrigating a lot less because because that's um, that's a tough one to manage all in itself is moving those irrigators around. I mean, that'll that'll swallow up half a day easy, you know, two people's time just setting them up. And and so, yeah, we're we're thrilled to see um, that cover crops are going to be a major player and not needing to do that. But for um, our 38 years of farming, I mean, we started in 78 and did not have irrigation until 96. I mean, talk about uh, mental torment watching, you know, those rain clouds go by without doing anything. And then there's your chance for the week. It just went by. And you didn't get any rain. And that's, that's hard. And we realized especially with the CSA when you're committed to produce a crop. I mean, you got to minimize every risk you can. Um, that was the nice thing about farmer's market. If you didn't have something, you, you weren't committed and obligated. You just, of course, didn't make any money because you didn't have that crop. Right. So with the, with the irrigation, what kinds of tools are you using for that? On, I mean, and again, because I'm just, I'm just thinking this is, yeah. I mean, I know how to irrigate 20 acres, but I, 320 is a little bit of a different it story. Is, it is. It is. Um, we have we have big 1,100-foot um, um, traveling guns. It's a wagon that we haul around. You pull the, the reel out. We, we like it. We don't have any center pivot because there's so many times in vegetable strips that 
you don't want those shirts to have water because they're big enough already, you know, or the potatoes are done. And so we love to target uh, the strips that we uh, want watered. And so we love traveling on the irrigation for that. Um, we're hoping on the years to come to need it less and less because of the organic matter. Uh, yep. We, oh, wow. When we first got irrigation, we ran pipes, you know, above the ground across the whole farm. I mean, talk about a nightmare of work to just irrigate one field. And so then we got an underground water line with hydrants all over the farm. So it was just a huge change in making, you know, that irrigating act a lot easier. Yeah, those those kinds of investments, I would think, are oh my gosh. well. Th- I mean, they matter on a small farm too. But I I imagine that, yeah. that for you, I mean, you you know, you get the trencher there and 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 spend a couple of days opening yeah. things up and dropping pipes and holes, and and you've just changed you've changed three hundred and twenty acres. Yeah, yeah. And even staff wise, we're re looking at um, not having the same poor people do everything, but actually having seasoned harvesters, you know, and then the packing shed people and the delivery people. So, I mean, we want everyone to experience everything, but, but, um, kind of trying to maybe, you know, do things more organized and smarter. It's a challenge. I tell you, anyone who does vegetables, the, the number of balls you juggle at one second, or it's fierce. Um, you know, you're watching for pests of everything. You're doing staged plantings and, um, <clears throat> you know, it's, it's I of all the things I've done in my life, you know, nothing is more rigorous to the brain and more overwhelming, you know, than a vet, than raising vegetables. And in uh, in my case, just even doing the CFA changed the rigor of what I do so much. So how do you how do you do the planning for this? I mean, I, I was thinking about this with regards to the to the cover crops earlier, but I mean, you just you just opened up this whole other realm, right? Of of the crop planning and the cover crop planning. What kinds of tools and ways of thinking are you using for that? Right, right. I mean, and once again, we're kind of heading into the unknown. Um, the the stores we're serving don't know to what proportion this will grow to, you know, and so I'm. It's a lot of times reading the future, but, you know, thank heavens I have 38 years of doing this. And a lot of my planning and how much we need is just based on the gut level realization of what one strip of sweet corn produces, you know. And so how many do we think we might need, you know, and then you realize with sweet corn, the demand is a lot more early than it will be late. And so... uh, uh, we do a lot of planning based on, you know, how, how much yield you can get per acre. And uh, This year when we're doing the blended CSA and store, when we're, we're planning big need, you know, so that we're ready when we know the need arises. Um, it's so much easier on the brain to have extra than to be short. Yes. <laughs> always because we've always, always better we've to have over capacity there, we? i mean yeah what do you do when you're short i mean of course i've been five five my whole life so i know that <laughs> <laughs> so when you when you're doing the planning work is this i mean is this a pencil and paper exercise yeah. are you using a fancy database i mean what, what's the what's your what's your actual mechanism for saying you know I need to put in two strips of sweet corn on such and such a date. Where where does that information actually get logged? Right, right. Very good point. We um, have an amazing operations manager now. His name is Jesse, and he um, he is well. He he was a banker. He was in retail management, all these kind of things. So he would ha- he has more all the little um, fancy gadgets and gadgets and all the things that make that happen. Um, for me, you know. You know, being a right brain person my whole life, I, I love my spiral notebook because everything's in one spot. And so I do the maps and the plannings of, um, you know, how many how many strips are really going to get broccoli and all of that uh, on that notebook. And so so being um, being 63, I mean, I love I love the paper and the pencil and all of that. <laughs> Uh, and then and, and that works, you know, believe it or not, that works. But now when he takes over the farm in a few years, then, I mean, he'll have fancier, better spreadsheet kind of ways that, that I'm not using right now. 
I just think it's, I mean, that's interesting, right? I mean, even on that scale that it's still a, it's still a pencil and paper exercise. And I don't think, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. It, it is. It is. And it's still a gut level guess. I mean, until we live through this next year, how, you know, you know, how, but we're planning big. I mean, just take an exciting thing like romaine lettuce and we're trying to picture when Facebook and Twitter and Jesse has all those things going and, and he's already, you know, rallying the troops and seeing amazing Facebook gains and all that kind of stuff. Um, how many romaine lettuce might we need? I mean, we're planning over the eight week period, you know, 200 to 500,000 heads of romaine. And well, what's the cost of that seed? It's, it's only like hundreds of dollars. It's not like a lot and the potential to make a lot is right there plus those same strips are going to become later patches of green beans so you know why not plant the extra planning planning big you know rather than oh no we're out of romaine lettuce i, I mean you can make like 25 to thirty-five thousand heads of romaine lettuce per acre you know which even if we only get a dollar wholesale is, that's not bad you know um right and then if you follow that with ten thousand dollars worth of beans for that acre all of a sudden, what we paid for that land isn't even a factor. When you're talking about something like that double cropping, it really works because you're putting in so much the year before and you're going to put in so much organic matter exactly. the year after with the cover crop that, that doing those two one after the other actually, it, 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 it still fits. You know, I think a lot of times that doesn't work if you're not actually putting back as much into the soil. But then that late patch of beans is going to get clovers in it. So, I mean, we're still even going to you know, get the cover crop in, even on that tight a rotation of crops. That's the nice thing about vegetable growing. I mean, you have such big windows of time, spring and fall, you know, for planting and growing things. It's kind of exciting. It's not like one crop takes the whole season on every strip. So. Right. I mean, I, you know, I always think that's, that's kind of the blessing and the curse, right? <laughs> it is a curse as well. You know, there's, there's a lot of potential to have a lot of bare yeah. soil. Yeah. Yeah. That's very true. So in that situation with as many, with as many residues as you must be dealing with, uh, what are you doing for weed control? Yeah. Um, I mean, that is still our issue because over 38 years we have built up this beautiful bank and you know? it's unfortunately not money, it's weeds, you know, uh, weeds and, um, so we're doing a lot of like uh, being real proactive on getting a strip ready, you know, so getting rid of that cover crop in plenty of time because I learned the hard way what seed maggots, you know, can do. Um, the seed maggots. I mean, is that something that you run into with with the cover crops? Right. You think you're doing these heroic things. And then, uh, you know, like with rye last spring, it's like, oh, I want to get as much organic matter as I can, you know. And so you you take it down as late as you think you can. But then you have all that beautiful organic matter in the soil trying to decompose, which is full of, you know, all of the biology that's eating that up. And if you plant your beans, you know, in that ground before that cover crop is worked up, there are seed maggots and, and your beans won't come up. I mean, what a nice surprise that is. You just waste three weeks waiting for those beans to come up and and their seed was eaten, you know, by seed maggots. And so you want to make sure as wonderful as cover cropping is, I mean, anything can also, that, that feeds you can also bite you in the butt. And so we we um, have learned, boy, you, you get back cover crop under you know we've also learned one tool in that is just some old board plow i mean a wicked monster from the past but like even tb farms which are experts in wisconsin on cover crops he'll he'll just plow that heavy rye under so it's out of the way of the vegetable crop and i think that minimizes you know the seed mag maggot problem and we we did moldboard plowing with one strip of um, field peas and oats that got really tall and you know what i just plow it it's like i i don't have time to deal with that trying to decompose on the top and if soon after that i planted um one of the later patches of beans you know which made wow what was this eight to nine thousand pounds in that one acre you know which was 132 harvest crates full of green beans by doing that so 
it's so, so many of those things you kind of learn the hard way and learn by doing. And um, you have to have always your eyes open to learn from those things so that it never happens again. And the bigger the pain, the, the better, the better. You, <laughs> <laughs> you sound like the, it sounds like love and logic parenting applied to farming, right? The big, <laughs> you know, the, the bigger, the bigger, the consequence, the, the better, the better, the opportunity for the future to not have it happen. You again. know what? Oh, that is so true. I mean, that is so true. So, so just with the, I mean, with the cover crops, I mean, just from a nuts and bolts perspective, do you have a rule of thumb that you use for how soon to turn in a cover crop before you're going to plant vegetables? Yep. Yep. I mean, if it's young and succulent, it depends on the crop. The, the tough one is rye because um, rye, um, you know, um, will tie up the nitrogen and will have the seed maggots, but it also makes such beautiful cover over winter and um and and such wonderful organic matter i mean those roots just hang on to biology which makes the glomalin which is the glue that holds the whole place together um so you want to use it but um it's a tough one to kill i mean to to kill cereal rye you have to be like a cereal killer you know and so so i i want to start on it like a month or two weeks to a month before I'm going to need it. Now, if it's something like clovers that are, aren't going to tie things up, then, then you, I mean, a week is just fine. But, but if it's got a lot of residue, I, I think a person wants to, uh, you know, get it in sooner. That's why I love the discovery of uh, clovers with my sedan grass. So that uh, all that residue, you know, has the clover to you know help not tie up all the end in the soil well and even i would think like like you mix in the clover with the with sudan if you chop that sudan now all of those yeah. all of those bits actually end up kind of being shaded by the clover so you you know right. and that's going to be a place that's going to encourage that much more biology where oh, you know there's some amazing. light but not too much light and yeah. and you know a little bit more humidity down there in that soil layer so stuff yeah. can really start to break down you know, and the earthworms are going to be pulling those little bits of clovers down, too, you know. Every night they come up pulling those things down. It's amazing. So for weed control, then, um, what, I mean, right. you said you've got, you've got a lot of weeds. Good but, question. But um, what kind of tools are you actually using out yeah, there? Yeah, you know, we've got a number of them. Um, we bought a new weed flamer and, and I can't remember the initials IFT or something like that. And they're at the Moses organic conference. Uh, beautiful, beautiful weed flamer. We had a, a crude um, probably almost blow me up one before that. And so this is just all the safety things and all of that. So we will um, work down that rye and let it sit and let it sit and then let the weeds grow and then actually plant into those weeds and then um, burn them or, our theme is burn the bastards. I mean, that's what our thing is. So we'll, <laughs> we'll flame them. Um, but then we also have like the Williams cultivator. It's like that little harrow, you know. Um, that um, It's got the, the tines on exactly. it, right? Exactly. Yeah. Beautiful. Beautiful. You know, if you time that right, um, it's like you get rid of all those little weeds when they're just scares, you know, coming out of the ground. And so that's magic. Um, we, um, have a basket weeder, of course, um, uh, and then and then if things get bad and and the weeds actually grow above the crop, we have um, what's called an organic weed puller that sits on the on the motor of a tractor and has two wheels that you know to go together and actually just pull up the weeds. And of course, you don't want right. weeds to get to that level, but. Uh, that's a tough one. I mean, weeds are the biggest battle that we have. Those little lambs quarters, you know, can can germinate like in a a vine crop like pumpkins in middle July and be a giant bush in no time. And there they are. You know, six six um, red root pigweeds can make enough seed for the whole acre the next year. And I, I always make sure I have more than six. Unfortunately, you know, <laughs> there they are. 108,000 seeds I learned at the last conference will come out of one pigweed plant. 
Wow. You know, I've got I got a picture of one of our one of our bottom fields. You can you can actually see the different colors of the different flushes of weeds yeah. where where we had different species from the last year. You know, there's there's the a red patch here and a yellow patch That's there. True. And yeah. a, it's just a real visual of of how much yeah. just how much of an impact it has. There's a lot of weed seeds out there. There are. There are. And it's nature's attempt to repair what we're doing, you know, it's um all part of nature's plan um a sad commentary on farming is just to look at a fence line and why is that feet higher than what we're farming ourselves you know it's like nature's building up soil and we're doing the opposite yeah that yeah up you know upening of the topsoil as as, as somebody yeah, called it a lot yeah you must have quite a fleet of equipment then that you're using, yeah. uh, you know, for, I mean, you're not, you're not using just one cultivating tractor to get across oh. you know, 320 acres of, of crop ground. That's exactly it. Um, we always look at what's backwards and sometimes it's that we only have one 35, 20 John Deere, you know, and, and that John Deere on certain days is supposed to be doing five different jobs. Well, then, then to make our farm less backwards, if we can afford it, we need more of that tractor. So we have, we have a fleet of, um, nine tractors, I think, um, I grew up red, you know, and now I've, our farm has become green. And that would, that would just disturb my dad a lot to know that that color change happened. <laughs> but, um, so, like, we have two 3520 John Deere's and four, two 4720s, and then other sizes going up to a 7330. But uh, we have a couple beautiful cases that we love, too. Um, but, um, yeah, and it all based on, you know, need and um and helping the farm be less backwards you know by getting those factors the nice thing is too they're zero percent interest you know so that small payment you make each year is really just to use it but then you luckily at the end own it and have it too well and they yeah well and they retain value so much yeah. too i mean yeah i i know that when we when we sold our tractors, I was I was shocked at at how much I was able to get for those, you know, relative to how much I use them. And I, I mean, true. I I don't think I I don't think I was screwing anybody over with those prices either. No, I mean, I think those no. were those were good solid prices. Amazing. And it was yeah, and it's amazing how those old tractors from the past, you know, fit into vegetable farms so well. And but then sort of the utility tractors of today do as well. I. I noticed like when I got rid of my H farm all, in fact, it was one that I learned to drive on. I mean, it had hung in there that many years and was still in beautiful shape. But um, when I, when that tractor went down the road for the last time and was sold and I got the utility ones, I could go from 36 inch rows because the tractors with the wheel space of the H was so big and, and my little um, utility ones so narrow that I could go from, 36 inch rows to 24 inch rows and all of a sudden get a lot more crop in per acre. Right. So how do you have that set up on your farm? Then you've got, I think that in your area, like in mine, the standard wheel width center to center on a tractor is 72 inches. Is that, is that how you've got your equipment set up? Um, you know, no, our, our tractors are set pretty narrow. So I think it's more like 55. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then, and then two rows underneath, or are you running three rows underneath? Um, you know, like our bands of broccoli are four, so they're just like nine okay. inches apart, um, and they fit between. They're just fine. Or like with sweet corn, beans, and corn, they are twenty-four inch rows, so they uh, the tractors work on that as well. So lots of flexibility built into that yeah, system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's a good point. I mean. All those little tiny things enter into the plan of your farm. And it's, uh, they do take thought depending on your equipment and how you want to do it. That's a good yeah. point. All right. So, Mark, we're going to take a break here, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. I want to talk with you about, about staffing on your farm because sure. you must employ the whole town of Fergus Falls. <laughs> Actually, we don't. So when we come back, we'll find out. All right. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, helping plants make sugar from sunshine since 1992. 
Through 23 years of producing the best potting soils you can buy, Vermont Compost Company founder and owner Carl Hammer has stayed intimately involved in the company, working with a small staff of committed individuals to provide compost-based potting soils chock full of microbial partners and humus-bound nutrients. The people at Vermont Compost Company have a practical understanding of the challenges organic growers face and combine that with a comprehensive understanding of soil and plant sciences and an intuitive comprehension that often has Carl and his crew sticking their noses into a handful of compost inhaling deeply as though they were sampling a fine brandy. Vermont compost is the real thing, built on consistency instead of glitz. Like the donkey on their logo, Vermont compost potting soils aren't glitzy or glamorous. They're steadfast and consistent, stubbornly making certain that your transplants can get everything they need from a few cubic centimeters of soil. Oh, and the donkeys are the real thing. You get a little bit of donkey manure on every batch of Vermont compost potting soil. Feed your plants the best. VermontCompost.com Bandwidth for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it's a truly superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability every farm needs. I've worked with BCS tractors for over 24 years, and I wouldn't consider anything else for my small tractor needs. And I'm not the only fan. More than 1.5 million people in 50 countries have discovered the advantages of owning Europe's most popular two-wheel tractor. And these really are small tractors with the kinds of features found on their four-wheeled cousins and a wide array of equipment. Power harrows, rotary plows, flail mowers, snow throwers, sickle bar mowers, chippers, log splitters, and more. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. bcsamerica.com. So Mark, you you actually grew up on the farm that you're on now, right? Yeah, yeah. And as I said earlier, when we were married, we bought a little 10-acre farm west of Fergus Falls. Um, in 1982, we realized the need for more land. And, and um, so we, we actually began to buy my parents' home farm, which was a dairy farm all the years I was growing up. Uh, and so that was 102 acres or something like that. Um, 30, some of it was pasture for the dairy cows on. So we came back, and during those years, I mean, we milked cows with my parents. We did the vegetables on a certain amount of land that we had, and I was a teacher of all that at that same time. My, my dad was determined, you know, that I be a dairy farmer and just hated our evolution toward vegetables. And so it was, it was a struggle. And you do see who won that battle, but, <laughs> but it, was, it, was, it was a tough time. Um, but I'm so glad now that we are on the family farm. And, and then over the years, we started buying pieces of land around ours. And with vegetables, you kind of don't want to be 10 miles down the highway because you live on those fields, you know, each summer. Um, so we got land across the highway from us and right beside us on both sides. Consequently, paying more because, you you know, they knew we needed the land. And, uh, so we paid um, plenty, but, you know, in the long run, you know, it, it that's not a factor even. Um, but last year we sensed the need, especially with build your own box at the trucks to be able to harvest things like potatoes and carrots by machine rather than by, you know, undercutting in hand like we'd always done. And that um, made a big difference buying that land. But if you buy new land, you don't know that land yet. And so you don't realize, oh my gosh, San Jerome doesn't hold any nutrients, you know, so the cover popping on that land, we're already seeing it's just going to make a giant effect. So we're kind of, you know, scaled up now to just go to the next level. Um, and as you scale up, though, I mean, there's always the pressure of money and um, making it all work. And um, it adds, adds significant pressure to one's life. Well, and I think about the challenges that we had on my farm when we well, when we invested in a mechanical carrot and beet harvester, you know, just like learning that tool. Oh, absolutely. Um, oh, my gosh, yes. Yeah. I mean, and you just talked about adding two new machines last year. Yeah. 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 We got the Univerco carrot harvester, which is oh, an amazing. Oh, how do you like that? That's that's right. the one that's actually mounted on the three-point hitch, right? Yeah. Yeah. And picks up the carrots, chops the tops off, and drops them in a bin? Right. Right. Beautiful machine. But, but to get... To, I mean, it takes a while to become good at it, and um, even how to plant the carrots so you, uh, you know, make it all happen. It's all an evolution. Funny, every learning you make, too, is, um, 
it's it's you learn it that season and you can't apply the learning till the next season. I mean, and, and you realize in your life, you don't have that many seasons to do. So you, you want to avoid, you know, any bad thing before it even happens. You want to kind of read the future, um, but also um, definitely learn from any mistake. Um, I'll never, you know, plant beans into kind of freshly dissed under rye ever, ever again. I learned that deeply that you don't do that. In farming, we have relatively slow iterations because it's it's this annual process, right? You screw up the beans this year. <laughs> it's not like it's not like you have you know you it's not like you have a bunch of opportunities to learn how to do that. Oh. So you've got to come back again next year yeah. and make the changes. And I think in most other industries, and you know particularly like in the technology field, but certainly in the industrial field, those iterations are a lot shorter yeah. you know i mean yeah. you can you can roll out an app for the iphone and and it can you know it can not be good and two weeks later you can roll out improvements right and then you can you know you get some feedback and you make some changes and you make some you just don't it's really hard to do that in farming it's, and i think it's painful i mean it's just painful if you make a mistake because you realize your whole season is is living with that mistake well, and I guess it's probably one of the blessings of being on a vegetable farm is, you know, especially a diversified farm is that That's it's true. you you can screw up the rutabagas and everything else can still be just fine. <laughs> yeah, that, that we used to. True. That's true. And then you do consecutive patches of those beans. So, I mean, you, yeah. you can redeem yourself, too. But, but, yeah. And when you bring in a tool like, I mean, let's just pick on the Univerco uh, carrot harvester. You bring in a tool like that. I mean, you've got a fairly large staff. You're not the guy who's necessarily out there operating it every day. Right. I mean, last year it was me. But, um, yeah, I mean, and and this year, Jesse, our operations manager, is, is hiring the staff. Surprisingly, we don't have as big a staff as you think. I mean, the nice thing about vegetables is you're not harvesting all those acres every day. You know, you're doing them all in stages. Vegetable farming is kind of like um, putting a puzzle together. You start adding the little pieces, you know, across your whole farm. And then as you harvest, you take them away one at a time. And so we kind of, um, I like to lead, just like I did in my classroom, lead the farm, lead the staff from behind where um, I don't come in like the drill sergeant saying all that needs to be done. I more turn it over to them and say, what do you think? Any thoughts and any ideas on this? Here's what we're facing. And it's amazing how many good ideas, you know, they come up with then if it were all just coming out of my little brain. And so, so we kind of seek out people who want to become farmers, who have a passion for it, uh, We'd rather have that than just mere workers because we want them to care and love the farm as much as we do. And and so that's helped us a lot with staff um, over the years. So how many people do you have working on your farm? You know, lately, just, uh, you know, up to 10 is all. Um, but then um, this summer, we're thinking 10 to 14 because of our divisions of labor and how we're going to do it all. That's really not very many people. Not many people, no, no. I mean, do you? I mean, are you guys working fourteen-hour days, or how does that? How does that well, all balance out? Uh, you know, when we would do the truck routes and be off on to Fargo, you know, until ten at night. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid some of those days were that. Um, that's why this year we want just dedicated harvesters and dedicated packing shed people, so that nobody. Is is overworking. You said that Jesse is your operations manager, so he's kind of is he sort of between you and the rest of the staff? Is he training well, to take over the farm? How does that yeah, how does that this, fit in? This year, this will be my first year ever where I'm kind of not managing everything. Um, I just can't wait. I'm gonna be in charge more of just the fields and keeping them up in the past i've always tried to be everywhere all the time i mean and it's just um the most challenging thing in the world to but you know staff would rise up to become leaders within themselves but i'd always feel the need to be harvesting when we were harvesting and you know be in the packing shed and be on the truck routes and managing the fields you know um so so i mean i can't wait for uh, i mean he really um uh, 
he is able, you know, to, to juggle all those balls. He's a social media person, uh, expert at that. Uh, um, he's being real careful on hiring, which I tend to be like the third grade teacher, you know, inviting all. Um, so he's, um, he's going to add <laughs> this amazing discipline to the farm. But our plan is that um, we're going to get the farm out of debt in a few years, and then he'll begin by contract for deed that's a no it's total win for him, you know, to start taking the farm on. Because my goal is I want to keep this farm going beyond me, you know, and you realize as you get older, beyond me happens pretty fast. But but I want to be on this farm forever, too. So, I mean, I plan to to die here when my walker tangles in the carrots and I fall down. <laughs> and, and that's it. I mean, that's my hope, because... Farming is something that just gets in your blood. I mean, and you you live it and, um, forever. How can you year after year after year still be excited when seeds germinate? I mean, isn't that crazy? What's the coolest thing, right? I mean, I mean, it is. It is. It's just, well, you look at a seed and think, I mean, people think, yeah, it grows, but oh my gosh, think what's happening within that seed. Somewhere it's sensing that there's warmth and there's moisture and Somewhere it gets that signal from the outside going to probably what the center of the embryo is saying, you know, it's time to kick everything into gear and start to grow. I mean, we take so much of nature for granted when really it's like, wow, amazing things that we'll never even begin to understand, you know, occur. So how can you well, get excited? I, yeah. I mean, it's, it's that whole process of turning, you know, soil, air, sunshine, and water into... Uh, into something that we can eat is just Genius. i don't know i think i think that's the, yeah <laughs> you know? and the carbon we exhale you know is from the energy that we consumed from the plant that took in the carbon and and then the plant's going to take that carbon in again it's funny how much of what's in a plant is really from the air you know it's crazy so when you say that you're doing um did you say a a, a deed for trust arrangement with with jesse is is this something that you actually have sat down and contracted out how that's going to go well we're not not to that point yet but i mean we we will be we first um want to make the farm successful in this new you know avenue that we're heading down and and um so and we're thinking within three years you know we should be free enough of debt where the transfer can start happening. And really it's not going to be like a light switch comes on or off because we'll still both be on the farm running it. It's just that, um, so I mean, we're, I mean, we're already shifting to him making a lot of the decisions regarding staff and media and all that kind of stuff. So, um, it'll just naturally evolve. I mean, the, the cool thing about the two of us is, um, we're a perfect complement to each other. I'm what he can't do, I can do, you know, and, and vice versa. So so we're learning a lot, you know, from each other. I um his his passion is deep and he uh, knows what it's gonna grow to. I mean, just adding agritourism this year is going to be exciting. Uh, and so our ideas kind of spill back and forth. It's gonna be terrific. Tell me about about that. I guess I didn't. I wasn't really aware that you were adding an agritourism component you know, this year. We are. You know, when we get the CSA, um, we have five signs. You know, that are across our land, and it says Bluebird Garden CSA. Welcome to your farm. You know, and and so beyond getting the box, we offered our members. Um, we gave them free tickets. You know, where they could come to the farm and uh, and and harvest with their family but it's not just that it's they're um, making a memory with their family they're feeling self-sufficient because they're stocked up for winter so like with those free tickets they got they could get like 10 dozen corn or a bushel of tomatoes or all these things so so people our csa members made a lot of memories with their family on the farm and we realized um so as we unfolded our new plan you know the csa members one of them sadly said i mean you're kicking us off the farm and it's like oh no you know it's just we instead of serving two to six percent of the population we want to serve them all and so so um you know we're planning a corn maze this year combined with uh 
uh, a pumpkin pick and hay rides, um, realizing we're going to need staff just to manage that. Um, but we also plan to meet with a caterer on having uh, farm to table meals, with, which are all local. I mean, all the produce from our farm, the meats from local. Um, in our magic woods, which is this thick planting of pine trees that's totally surreal. I mean, it was it was planted on a hill in the pasture where I used to slide down in the winter, you know, when I was young. And it just, it's like magic. I mean, and so so we really want to um, make a welcome to your farm be for like everybody. And, and the connection and the tickets for those will be at the stores because we want to cement within those stores the idea that your ticket to Bluebird Gardens in any way to get our produce or to, to come to race through that local store. I mean, so so it's it's just a real pioneering thing, at least in our area, to um, to really bond a farm with a store. And so in each of these towns, that store is the only spot where the connection to our farm is going to occur. So it's like win, win, win for them, you know, but but also for us because we're not serving two percent of the people anymore. Well, and and you can still do those deliveries in bulk, you know, instead of having oh. instead of having twenty one pound bags of beans, you get to bring twenty pounds yeah. of beans in a box. Exactly. Yeah. So you've set up these arrangements. It sounds like with with grocery stores in towns yeah. around Fergus Falls. It's yeah. not. Yeah. It's not like you're going. All of this is happening over in Fargo. No, in fact, yeah, very good point. We are trying to reach out to the same area we served with our CSA. You know, so for example, Wapiton Breckenridge was uh, back when we did the stands. It was a huge part of our farm, but then when the CSA was the same, and so we'll be in the Cano Foods there. Um, Fergus, Fergus Falls, where we've been forever. You know, the the long time local store is you know, service food. And so we met with their owner way last spring. I sent him a letter saying, why don't you become, you know, our store and you become the only place where people can get our produce. And, and, you know, within minutes of him getting that mail, he called me saying, let's meet, you know? And so, so, um, and what I just hear from people in the community is just royal excitement that, wow, you're going to be in service food, you know, and, and, then they can get exactly what they want, when they want it, you know, as as we, you know, all fly by the seat of their pants to do everything we have to do every day. And so now they're going to find their farmer's market right in the store where they already shop. So when you say they're going to find a farmer's market right in the store, are you planning on having special retail setups for these farms? Um, I mean, or is it just going to be displayed alongside the rest of the produce? No, that's a good point. Um, they're planning a separate area for our stuff, and it's going to have pictures, posters, labels, our brand, um, videos. I mean, it will really be a true connection you know, to our farm in that store. So, um, so yeah, we're going to evolve into that. Each store is in charge of how they would like to set it up, but, um, but they're excited and we're excited and we're not all sure where it's going to go, but it's going to be good. That's just really, I think it's really interesting and fascinating that you're taking that on at such a big level. It's not like you're just edging into doing wholesale. Yeah. I had a poster um, all the years I taught third grade, and, and um, it was a picture of a, oh, like a baboon in ice water, and it said, life is either a daring adventure or it's nothing at all. <laughs> so how, about how much of your business are you expecting to shift to the grocery stores this year? Um, you know... Really, a lot of it. We're um, instead of seven truck routes with the CSA, we're planning one truck location in our in our most popular area of Fargo Moorhead. So, like in Fergus Falls, my hometown, and all the other areas that we serve, including Detroit Lakes, um, it, we will be like store only. Um, but wow, Mark, go big or go home. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Wow. 
but but we've done the numbers, you know, and if we can focus on harvesting and getting it out um, and serving more people, I mean, the risk of it is really it's not not much. I mean, how could it not go well? I've, all I've heard in Fergus for the last six years is, oh, I wish you'd go back to the stand, meaning that we'd serve everybody. And, and so, yes, our ear has been to the rail long enough where that's exactly what we're going to do. And I guess you guys have enough of a marketing presence in those places because of the stands and because of your long history with the CSA. Right. It's not like you're just setting this up and you're summoned on. It's not like Chris Blanchard showed up in Fergus yeah. Falls and set up a, yeah. you know, set up some deal with the grocery store. And that, that's exactly what we're counting on. You know, it was kind of funny all the years we did the stand. You know, you pay your dues, don't you? You really pay your dues. And so we were there in the, at those stands year after year after year in every kind of weather, you know. And, and so flocks of people would be over time at our stands. And. And other local, you know, people would see that. And so then they park um, their pickup, you know, like a block from our stand, and thinking flocks of people would be around that pickup that they're sitting in. And, and you know, they would say, what the because people didn't come, you know, to their pickup. And it's not that easy. It's like over time, you know, you, you, uh, you pay your dues enough so you create the following. I mean, like, I just went to a Tina Diffley's class on uh, oh, um, wholesale success and all that. And what she and Martin did, you know, to make Gardens of Eden just be a royal name in the Twin Cities, you know, but it was a lifetime, you know, that, in which they did that. Yeah, that kind of success. I mean, it, it just does. Well, I shouldn't even say that kind of success, like any kind of success. It doesn't come overnight. No, no, it doesn't. All right. So, Mark, with, with that, let's turn to our lightning round. Sure. All right. So, you have a lot of tools on the farm. What's your favorite? Oh, the BH100 Bean Harvester. Turn my life around. So, tell me how a, tell me how the BNH Bean Harvester works. It's, um, it's amazing. Um, it's from Oxbow. It's a one-row machine, and you just... Uh, like, say, for example, Michael and I last fall on that bean patch I was talking about. So in an afternoon and evening, we picked 132, you know, harvest crates of green beans, which would have been, I don't know how much staff that would have taken, you know, in previous years. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's magic what that machine can do. And it was, it was $35,000. I mean, and yet. Whoa. You know, but in that afternoon, it picked like ten thousand dollars worth of beans. So, right. So I mean, that's it it's got a payback on it. So, yeah. so it goes through. It goes through on the plants. <laughs> is it? Is it like have some brushes that are that yeah, are beating the beans it has, off? It has rakes, you know, so it will rake every leaf and every bean and every everything off the plant. So after that harvesting, you know, it looks like a hailstorm. So then you just call your insurance guy and you know tap into that <laughs> so it strips it strips the 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 beans and the leaves uh, and everything off the plant it's in, how does it separating and those out and it throws them on a conveyor and part of that conveyor is a fan so then you can set the fan speed to suck up whatever you want off of there if you set it real aggressive it might take some beans um, but if you set it too slow it'll leave a lot of debris in there um th this um Summer, we're hoping to get their bean cleaner where those beans go over a vibrating table and you, you um, any any debris that might be in there, you get out of there. Then that's something where it's it's more of a manual sorting yeah, process in the packing sheet. Yeah. 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 Those bean shaker tables. Boy, I used to, um, I worked on a farm where we had one of those and I, I stare at that thing. I'd always get seasick. Yeah. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> yeah. Did you find it worked? Yeah, I mean it definitely worked. Um I mean I think what was interesting was that to get the to get the beans back to the quality that we got from doing careful hand picking in the field. It I'm I think and, and this has been 20 years so I might be wrong about this but it, it wasn't such a huge labor saver but what it did is it shifted where the labor was happening yeah. which was an important piece. Sure. You know, it took it out of the field and put it up in the packing shed. Right. That's and and I think that was, you know, 
I think any time you can make that shift, you know, you're now you're out of the sun, you're in a more pleasant environment. I mean, I shouldn't right. say a more pleasant environment than picking out in the field, but more ergonomic than picking beans, mm -hmm. you know? And I think sometimes when you're looking at labor saving stuff, that's an important consideration, right? It's not just about how much work do you save? It's how do you feel at the end of the day? Right, right, right. That's true. And that's the same with the corn harvester. I mean, that picks everything. So you are doing sorting in that wagon, you know, so it's not all perfect but you do like you say shift it you know from one spot to another yeah well and i think the other thing that you do like with the shaker table and and i would think the corn picker is the same is that you you set in place a mechanical process whereas if you're walking through the the cornfield you know you can pick slow or you can pick fast right but if the corn's coming off the conveyor you're reacting to how fast that corn's coming off the conveyor. Sure. And I think that's a that can be a really good way to be able to set a pace for people. The bed, and, the bed layer know, too is a wonderful pace yeah. setter. It's probably the best. Because that thing you're just you're driving through the field and the yeah. veg is in front of people and they're just they're keeping up with it, right? Yeah, yeah. It's fun to just set the thing in high gear and just go. <laughs> no, I never <laughs> I never do that. I've done that in right? Yeah. <laughs> You like your people too much. It's, I mean, it's easy to be an asshole with that kind of thing. So, I mean, Mark, you mentioned that you were just at the Wholesale Success Workshop. And I mean, you and I met at a conference. And I mean, clearly you're trying a lot of new things and new approaches all the time. Where do you turn when you need when, when you need information about something new or something that you haven't tried before? Right. Well, the internet you know which to us is new you know because uh email started in the 90s you know and you were born in the 50s that that's like pretty recent um so the internet is amazing um i i found our farm though changed the most when i started using personal base for my teaching to begin to attend conferences you know and so our farm changed because of Terry Nenick at the minnesota fruit and vegetable growers conference and because of the Minnesota Organic Conference and because of the Moses Organic Conference. So I think, boy, going to those conferences, I, you know, and it's always like, where do you really learn stuff? And it's it's a combination of the trade show floor. It's it's the people you talk to. Um, it's the sessions you go to. And when I gave workshops for teachers all along, I said, now, if you can just bring one thing back that changes your classroom, if the day was worthwhile. And and the same is true with all those conferences. How, uh, how uh, you know if you can bring at least one thing back that changes your farm, it's a royal success. I always, well, when I worked for the Moses Conference, when I started the the um, the rates for attending were really really low. And in yeah. fact, you know the the conference was losing money year after year. Wow. And and when we set out to start raising those rates, we got a lot of pushback on. Um, when we, when we were working to get it into the black, cause I don't think people really understood. Sure. I mean, it's hard. It's, I mean, just like your customers don't understand necessarily all of the expenses that go into getting some green beans, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's a hard thing to get, but we had a lot of pushback and I, and I, I used to say to people, it's like, well, you, you know, you come to this conference mm -hmm. and it only takes one idea, right? It's one idea yeah. and you're going to make back everything you spent on it. And plus you get to apply the same idea next year mm -hmm. and the year after that and the year after that. And talk about return on investment. I think education's, you know, far and away the best bargain out there. It is. You hit the nail on the head. That was awesome. So what was the, what was the last purely recreational activity that you did, Mark? <laughs> you know what? I, I go to the YMCA. So I, I, uh, that's, that's my best thing is just to go there and I take a class called insanity where it's the most rigorous workout in the world. Um, so I'm not sure if you call any of these things recreation, but just, um, meeting with every, uh, age of people at the YMCA is probably my best recreation. Uh, we have friends we meet with too, you know, almost weekly. So that's recreation. As far as um, trips and that, we, you know, in farming, we just have not done it. Farms tend to swallow up every penny you make because you're always investing in it. And, and yeah. um, I, I think the hardest part of running a farm just, just gives the money. I talk to people from every size of farm and, and, and money's the issue. Local Harvest did a 
uh, survey of CSA farms and what things are they worried about the most, you know, guess what was top of the list? Money. Yeah, money. You know? But guess what was second? That isn't a shocker. It's, it was climate gone crazy, you know? And that was their second worry was just um, weather tends to be more dramatic than it was back in the 1900s. Well, and I mean, yeah, I mean, more dramatic than it was in the early 2000s. I mean, I remember when we started farming, it was, you know, and on our own place in Rock Spring Farm in 1999 in Decorah, Iowa, you know, you'd get some rain. Right. You get an inch yeah. or two of rain and then and then you'd get a week and then you get another inch or two of rain. It was like normal for a lot of years. And then in, yeah. I think it was about 2006, things just started to get wacky. Yeah, I remember going you know? to your conference and just seeing, you know, the picture you took after just a giant rain. And, and it's just like uh, we all know that horrible feeling. Well, and I think I mean, I think it's one of the things that's that's so cool about the way that you're going about the farming now is, you know, really focusing on how do you work to create that, that climate resilience? You know, yeah. I, I talk a lot about this idea of a, of thing, uh, you know, of making things into a picnic problem, you know, a picnic problems when, when the problem's in the chair, not in the computer. Right. And I think, and I think the great thing about, about a picnic problem as a manager is that then you can do something about it, you right. know, in climate change, dealing with the weather. I mean, you know, we can all contribute to that by banking carbon and, you mm-hmm. know, driving less, whatever else. But, but really as a manager, what we have to do is figure out how are we going to deal with the fact that this is happening? Right. Right. You know, and, and so doing things like building your organic matter, you know, getting the cover crops into rotation, all of that kind of stuff that really I think is, is building that capacity to deal with those shocks. It is. Oh, Hey, I wanted to, I wanted, sorry, that was a little off topic from the last purely recreational activity that you did. This is supposed to be the lightning round. So um, <laughs> I'm curious, you, do you work out at the Y all summer long too, even you know, when you're farming? No, I have to start getting it up in April because there just isn't time. Just not time. Yeah. 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 Okay. And if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Boy, that's a good question. You know, let your farm be what you want it to be. I mean, the most important thing for each of us who have a farm is to find our niche and what is your talent that's going to connect people to your farm. And and don't look at other farms and think what you should be. Don't compare them. One of the saddest comments I hear is, oh, we're just small. It's like, oh, my God, there's no such thing as just. Uh, your farm is amazing, you know, in what you do. And and let yourself bump along and grow and change as what's good for you. I, um, there's there's no need to try and get bigger. We That's what we evolved into doing. But um, our, our best year is actually when we were when we were just a small farm and and not that it's bad now now it's you know exciting too but um feel good with what you want your farm to be and the niche that you have and the people you serve and you know we all unite together to to bring the message of local you know to the people you serve thank you so much mark well you are so cool chris think of all the lives you've changed it's such a privilege to be able to, you know, to work with folks like you to share the story. So yeah. well, thank it's you. It's an exciting story across our country, isn't it? It's really great. Yeah. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Have a good week. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 52 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Bowen. That's B O E N. I've got a string of events coming up in the next couple of weeks. My Better Farm Boss Workshop in Grays Lake, Illinois is on February 17th. More information on that is available at purplepitchfork.com slash better boss. I'll be at the Oregon State University Small Farms Conference in Corvallis on February 20th. And on February 25th, I'll share my full day session, Manage Your Way to Farm Success at the Moses Organic University. I'll also be at the Moses Organic Farming Conference the two days following that, talking about herb management and time management. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy my weekly email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. I'd encourage you to sign up at farmertofarmerpodcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. 
Also, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on the book. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to an ever-growing circle of listeners. One more thing, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions that I received through the contact form on farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Please let me know who you would like to hear from, and I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.